Thank you, Prof Nazari. Now we come to Q and A session. Okay, uh, you can come to mic and introduce yourself. You can post your question to Prof Nazari or Dr Sharifa. Good evening. My name is uh, Adriana Abu. I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I've actually also been in the government for about 11 years in the judiciary in the AG's chamber. So my first question, or rather uh, sharing, is to Professor Rashila. When you were talking about women, Shahira. Oh, Shahira, sorry. <laughs> Old. When you were talking about women, my observation basically, yes, it's true. In in government, how I observe is the majority of women, hardworking ones, the hardworking civil servants, especially my former department, were women. The men were relatively useless. But when you go to promotion, the men were getting, um, they, they were actually getting preferred treatment. And uh, I can't really say it's the women or the men. But the women who were in power as well were supporting such um, bias treatment. And uh, I had a former colleague of mine. He was actually the legal advisor for Kementerian Wanita. And he didn't last long there because he wasn't a favorite with the, with, the, with, the, with the minister at Kementerian Wanita. And he said that when they were trying to propose for, for policies or for objectives to actually um, to improve the equality between men and women, the women themselves were against it. So he was actually, my, my former colleague, he was saying that it was mind-boggling that the women were actually standing in the way of the advancement of women themselves. And personally, I've experienced that. Um, some of my bosses, um, they were fighting for women's rights, for their own individual female rights, basically. They were using their boyfriends and their husbands who had connections to rise up. But when other women want to, base, we want to be promoted based on meritocracy, they just stamp down on them. Uh, that may be my own personal bias, but that was my experience basically, and I don't want to name names. Most of them have been fired anyway, my former female bosses. So maybe if you have an opportunity, it's a cultural mindset. Um, and when you were talking about ILCAP, I've gone for training in ILCAP for the past 11 years, more than the 10 fingers in my hands. I have never remembered any, how to say, female empowerment uh, uh, cursus that I went there because it was compulsory. Every year we had to go for a minimum of seven days. Maybe now they've changed, I don't think so. Talk about sexual harassment, it exists, right? It's not just being raped or being uh, kena rubber ke apa. There were a lot, and it was in the judiciary, among the judges as well, in AG's chambers, and I remembered one of the last meetings I attended before I resigned, Tan Sri Ghani was finally, uh, after more than, I don't know, two decades, he actually told everybody, especially the men, like, you have to treat them not like as sexual objects, you have to treat your female colleagues as if they are your sisters and your mothers. A bit too late, uh, I think, after two decades, only then you are giving something on a lip service. So it's, to say that it's a system, maybe not so. I'm just sharing. Uh, we have a long way to go, and it's not just a cultural mindset that the men have to change. The women themselves, especially those women who feel that they are better than other women, holier than thou, walking around as if, just because they meet a certain standard of how Muslim clerics say they should be, you know, but to ka apa ke, berjubah ka apa ke, they have to, you know, it's one thing having a personal opinion about another woman, but when you bring it into the public life, when you bring it into even corporate practices and you, imp you include it in the policies, that's not right for me. Um, equality for me basically is equal opportunity, meritocracy, regardless of whether you're a man or a woman. So maybe if you have an opportunity when you're having engagements with the government, those are things maybe you can highlight. I couldn't when I was in government because you definitely takkan naik pangkat when you open up like this. <coughs> Okay, uh, I don't have a question for you, it's just a sharing. So to Professor Nazari, right, uh, two very short questions. Um, I've attended sessions, um, not really economic talks basically, but just talks throughout my years of working. And um, the, the perception is that Malaysia, we are not a welfare state. <coughs> we're not like a um, welfare state, I can't remember, like Ireland for example, we're not. But uh, as I see it, we have a lot of policies, subsidies. Uh, that is something which is ingrained in our culture. Kalau tak ada subsidi itu melenting lah orang Melayu, basically. Uh, we have a lot of handouts, we have brim, what else we have? A lot of things. So can't we say that basically Malaysia, we are a, a welfare state? Right. Uh, that's a question. And secondly, when you talk about failed systems, that it is not corrupt politicians or greedy uh, corporate figures. The problem is uh, failed systems. But exactly who created these failed systems or these systems in the first place? Can we realistically separate those people who control it or who, who benefit from it from the systems? Maybe you can, you know, if we want to separate it like that to find a solution, can we actually realistically do that? 
we do actually need to look at the people who are running it, who are benefiting from these so-called failed systems. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Hazman from IRF. Um, I have two questions for Dr. Shahira. Uh, the first one is when you were discussing about uh, women position in leadership, I do think that uh, just discussing about women's position in leadership is not enough. Because the, one of the biggest problems facing women now is not discrimination in the public sphere, but in the domestic sphere. So the problem now is that there are so many cases about uh, women being treated violently, not just physically and emotionally, but also sexually by their husbands. And from your research, uh, how do we get to know these kind of statistics? Because in our society, uh, this statistic has been so opaque because many women would not want to tell it out because of this bullshit of kerukunan rumah tangga something, right? So uh, this is something that uh, maybe from your research, how do we get to know this issue uh, more deeply? Uh, that's the first one. Second question is about social mobility. Uh, when you are talking about we want to have 30% women in uh, top government position or in top corporate position, uh, but the problem now is uh, there are real demands of motherhood that the woman needs to succumb themselves to and that will uh, deny social mobility towards them. Now, just imagine that if we want women to, if we want certain amount of women in directorial position, uh, we have women who are high income, uh, at least maybe manager level, they can afford to pay mate, they can afford to pay some other people to uh, take care of their child and then they can work harder and then they can achieve that directorial position. But what about women who are currently ordinarily working people? Because I have some first-hand experience with women who need to quit their job just because they need to take care of their child. So this demand of motherhood is real and based on your research, how do we uh, tackle this problem in terms of legal instruments, in terms of uh, knowing what is the issue in the society that leads to this. Now, these are uh, two, my two questions. Uh, and one question for, to Professor Nazari. Um, now, when we look at the record of Malaysia's high growth, one of the highest in the world, which is I think 5.9% for 2017, uh, I frankly think that this number it doesn't make sense. Why? I am working in a JLC, a big JLC, working long hours but being paid peanuts. Um, so uh, when I ask the managers in my company and some friends in some other companies, the sentiment is that, oh, market tengah slow, uh, economy tengah down, many people are doing VSS and something. So this recorded high growth just doesn't make sense. So in your opinion, Prof, how can, we, how can we record that kind of growth if the corporate sentiment now doesn't show that we are actually doing, we are actually, uh, doing good? So, uh, should we be worried? I mean, should we be worried that the economy will be overheated and at one point it will boom, everything will crash and we are all dead? So, ah, another thing, Prof, can I suggest you something? This is the means of production. I mean, that's a joke. Oh, you don't get a joke. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, my first two questions is directed to Professor Nazari. Uh, assume I'm a layman here. Now, all my working years, I have been given the impression that for financial regulators or banking regulators, uh, the most effective tool in controlling the money market or money situation is the interest rate. Your first chart, when you show uh, Alan Greenspan, of all the people, Alan Greenspan, with all this experience in uh, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, he chose to re reduce the interest rate, which in turn create excitement for people to borrow money at a very low cost. This in turn creates this artificial or real demand for more housing projects, this and that. Now, <clears throat> as a financial regulator, uh, I believe if this low interest rate is kept for a long 
longer period than is necessary, it creates what you call an overheating economy. There's too much cash there that people need to uh, spend. They thought that money is easily available, spend. So they chose the property sector. Um, so my question is, uh, interest rate, ni, why can't any regulator determine a, a period eh, that the effectiveness of a low interest rate? Because I, I notice in some countries, the moment they see overheating in the economy, they will in, increase the interest rates. So we'll cool down the thing. I realize there is this argument eh, in the Greece punya financial problem. There were two schools of thoughts. Greece went bankrupt because uh, of, of this problem. Lah. So one was saying, you should go on an austerity drive. And another school of thought, if everybody goes on austerity drive, you kill everybody. So you must have incentive to stimulate the, the, the economy, meaning give them more loans. So we are caught in this situation. Uh, telan mati mak, luah mati bapak. So how does one address that kind of situation? Okay, the other thing is your second chart. You showed that once this uh, loan grows, kan? the loan portfolio grows, the banks will then sell this uh, debt apa ni? to another bank so that they can get money in return uh, for this loan that has been given out to, to, to those uh, borrowers. Lah. Then I see some similarities the way it works with insurance. Like Lloyds of London, I, I believe, uh, when they insure a, 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 a super tanker, oil super tanker, the premium comes to probably hundreds of millions of pounds. But they share the revenue and they share the liability by selling part of it to other corporations, other individuals. So the, the subprime crisis is very much similar like what the insurance companies are doing. But the only problem was that at that time, the housing property market, boom, it burst. But the insurance industry did not. So they survived. So uh, it's just too bad. Lah. The Americans at that point in time, the property bubble burst too soon. Lah. And uh, they, they were basically, they were rich, but on credit. Lah. Uh, so those, those are my two questions to Professor Nazari and to Dr. Shahira. Only one question. Short, simple one. This child marriage, uh, I'm quite disturbed with that child marriage punya issue, uh, especially when you show the statistics. I want to go to beyond that statistics. Uh. Has there been any study to indicate the socio demographic uh, profile of those child marriage? Because deep inside, inside me, uh, I get this gut feeling uh, this child marriage thing. <coughs> is actually come from families who are very poor, very little education, in a situation where marriage is the only way out of this economic hardship. And I dare say that because my late parents, when they were still alive, they narrated to me stories about her relatives who were matchmade and get to marry is a rich guy, old guy, because the parent could not afford to raise them. There, there is a few cases that she mentioned. Uh. So there could be some economic issues behind it. So I wonder whether people really look into the social demographic economic issues on this child marriage. Okay, that is all my question. Uh. Okay, thank you so much for the questions. This is a very active audience. All right, uh, to Miss Adriana, I agree with you. There are discrimination. It's actually a paradigm shift. You know, even if I me we mentioned that we are feminists, somebody will just raise the, their eyebrows like, okay, all right? Because it's something that is um, it's about change. Change is not easy. But the thing is how we manage the change. If you look at the women movement, it took a long time for us to reach to what we have now. 
I mean, like if our great grandmother look at us now, it's like you know, it's a huge difference. Uh, in terms of when we talk about um, lad ladies, yeah. All right. Yeah, so, <laughs> all right, so in terms of that, maybe the, just now the, the news uh, about Malaysian women uh, mentioned by UN committee members that our Muslim women's right is regressing because of the Sharia law, maybe, yes. It is uh, it's, it's based on the observation, it seems to be that way. Uh, in terms of uh, the one that you mentioned just now about uh, discriminatory treatment in public sector, I think uh, when it comes to women ladies, uh, especially the bosses, uh, we are used to be com compartmentalized, you know, whereby uh, it's the feeling that we, we kind of like only few uh, women should be up there, all right? It's a new thing. So what we need to do is just to be patient and change uh, the power relation and instead of power, t power over, like I'm better than you, you're better than me, it's go to power with that let's work together because this is how um, women NGO works uh, the synergetic movement of power with okay then we can have a better uh, uh, it it would take time seriously it would take time like just now uh, you said about we only have 19 percent or nine percent of uh, women in leadership sectors in three years three years is very short Okay, women' uh, movement takes a long years uh, for us to uh, make changes. But sometimes, in terms of Muslim women in the Muslim uh, Sharia law, we are kind of like frustrated because it seems to be like there's a movement to really uh, push us backward. Okay, um, in terms of gender training, I agree with you. When I ask uh, Kementerian Wanita, they say that uh, yes, we have, but we are not really sure what more do. Uh, even ilkap also, all right. Um, sexual harassment again. I agree. It's not just about touching or physical. There's visual, psychological, verbal harassment, and so far what we have is just SOP, and this SOP is not, it's not really, yeah, it's not really implemented well, because you are talking about your bosses, you know, harassing you. It doesn't really work that well. It's not easy for you to just fight the current. Yeah? Okay, in terms of uh, husband, Jasmine, uh, talking about discrimination, uh, you are talking about women, position, leadership, what's document? What document we are talking about? Okay, Joanna? All right. Okay, in, in terms of uh, violence. Okay, um, in, uh, if you look at CEDO reports, you can actually go online, all right? There are, uh, you can get CEDAW report for all states all over the world. So if you want to take from Malaysia, there's a shadow report, there's alternative reports, and there's also government reports. So there's uh, in article one of the article, they talk about violence against women, and there's a lot of data in that. Uh, so far in Malaysia, compared to child marriage issue, uh, we are not, uh, we are, it's not a, sec it's not a uh, secret uh, information, it is quite public. So in terms of domestic violence, you can find the, 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 the data. Yeah, there's a lot of data. And in terms of social mobility, a real demand of motherhood. For me, motherhood is, is about uh, to build a family. To be a family without fatherhood, it doesn't work. <laughs> All right? So father, also a worker. But the problem is the tradition and religious, the, the, the one, the two, uh, the two pendai tadi. All right? Uh, they just want to reinforce and saying that, come on. I think, you know, because men, a lot of men refuse to do housework, so we better promote this, <laughs> you know? So um, I think, uh, I disagree with uh, Kementerian Wanita campaign, not 100% agree. You know, they, they say, apa? Uh, tahun pemekasaan wanita. All right, for me, it's tahun pemekasaan hak wanita. Because I think women are already empowered. We are 
already undergoing the process. But we need the pemangkasan hak wanita. I think Rahimi mentioned, uh, mentioned one of uh, uh, the participants mentioned about pemangkasan hak wanita. It's not memangkasakan wanita itu sendiri. And for me, the one that need to be empowered are fathers in the private sphere. All right. So I think all of you, maybe later on, you know, it's 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 a lot of work at home. There's a lot of work. So instead of letting your wife um, you know, uh, quit their job, encourage them not to quit their job and work together. And I disagree with uh, foreign domestic workers um, because for me it's not fair. The system is wrong, but of course we need it because we can afford it. But if you really believe that the principle is wrong, try to avoid it. And like me, I avoid from taking domestic worker uh, because I just take part time because I believe they, they're supposed to take care of their family. All right. So for me, it's actually uh, number one, the spouse job, uh, the fatherhood. We should actually emphasize on the role of fatherhood. Okay, uh, empower fatherhood. Okay, instead of woman empower, do this. You go outside, do the best like a man. Come back at home, be the best mother. At the end of the day, <laughs> no, go crazy. Yes, I agree. Okay, so it's just yes. Yes. All right, so I agree with you. Okay, this is another one, another point about state responsibility. So that's why when we sign all the document, uh, the document of CEDO, uh, Beijing Platform of Asia, SDG and so forth, you know, that's why we are talking about uh, we're supposed to have a good flexi hours, you know, but the thing is, it's very hard for us to get it done because it seems to be like a very soft issue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so in terms of that also, childcare is like a never-ending issue, all right? Again, because it's a soft, they say it is a soft uh, issue, it's not really important, okay? So I think it's, yeah, it is very important, obviously, but not for the top management, okay? Because it's incur cost, especially for the companies. Uh, small, small companies like my companies, there's no childcare center because then you have to incur costs and so forth, and then uh, the... Uh, uh, government only give a few grants, uh, like few thousand, maybe ten thousand, to just start the the childcare. So it's not really attractive. So in terms of that, yes, uh, it's a state responsibility. If you want women to go out there and work, okay. So in other words, we need to have uh, better facilities. But of course, the tradition and also religious way of thinking also needs to be changed. Instead of um, saying that women's uh, the best job is to be, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, this is the thing that uh, we need to ponder because if you see, if you, if you, uh, if you, what you said, and also the observation of Nusantara women, okay, they are empowered. But I think no nowadays is there's a, a kind of like there's one a concept they call urbanization. You know, so it seems to be like they are trying to bring after all this, uh, a lot of ladies in IPTA, okay, like, like very high percentage of now they kind of like 
promoting the other way around. So, yeah. So this is the thing that we need to always talk about. And of course, a government, uh, NGOs, uh, women NGOs are advocating for a better state, uh, to, a state to fulfill more responsibilities. Yeah, inshallah. And child marriage, yes. I agree that it is uh, one of it is because of poverty. But for Malaysia, it's also because of the, they are afraid of premarital sex. So that's one of the reasons. And Indonesia also the same thing. So maybe because of poverty and then because of uh, the, way they, the way of thinking of their parents. So they ask the daughter to marry off early, easier responsibility, so they don't have to get uh, worried about the, the daughter to, yeah, to, to have babies earlier. But this thing is not only happening in underdeveloped countries, it's also happening in the United States. There are around, in seven years, or five years, there are around 200,000 plus in the United States. They married uh, because of uh, premarital sex and, and then uh, pregnancy, early pregnancy, and also because of the rape issues. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, many of the issues on women apparently are also related to the issue that I'm talking about just now in terms of cost of living, etc. <coughs> But I don't want to go into there because that could misunderstood society. Uh, now uh, I just want to mention in passing that nowadays young people, when they look for future wives, many will consider only if the woman has got a job. Uh, if the woman is doesn't have a job, they say no, this is not a good candidate because because they say that they can't afford to marry somebody who doesn't have a job. So actually, uh, woman. Staying at home now, just now, even though the two dainis praise them, it's no longer an option. You have to go out and work yeah, in order to survive in this current, uh, yeah, uh, because of cost of living. And now you, do, you can't even afford. You know that uh, our fertility rate now is actually uh, 1.9 only in Malaysia. Uh, less than, you need 2.1 in order to ensure continuity. Uh, but Malaysia, people used to have five, six children. Now, 1.9. So uh, our population will shrink. In Japan, is in Singapore, is worse. Singapore is 0 0.83 only. Uh, the head is missing, only the body is. Uh. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go back to the questions. Is Malaysia a welfare state? That was the question just now. Uh, y yes, in, in certain aspects, as you know, uh, uh, education, primary education, secondary education is actually subsidized. And then uh, you go to hospitals, government hospitals, the government pays a lot. But now, as you know, the government is slowly cutting back. Uh, you have to pay for many things yourself. My, one of my uh, friends just recently uh, had a heart problem. He went to Sungai Buloh and he was informed that, that he needs to come up before they can put a stand, two stands in his uh, heart. He needs to uh, come up with 30,000, 35,000, something like that. This is Sungai Buloh. Huh? This is, this is, I don't know. But basically, you have to. He has no choice. So he had to go to where? No, <laughs> Tawakal, private, because his brother works there. So he can get a lower rate at the private hospital. A government hospital is higher than private hospital. So now the welfare state is fast disappearing. But actually, Malaysians, um, Malaysians. All this while, they, they, they don't understand how public finance work. They think that government can, can afford all this. Uh, they, do, they do not know all this while government is borrowing money uh, to fund all, this, all these activities. Right? Now, in my opinion, this is a big topic, right? but the, the, the approach of our society of, of relying on government for, to help each other, to help population to help society to provide services to help poor people right is even to build mosques when many people now rely on the government whereas the islamic way from what i understand uh, according to one economist he said that look the, when there were poor people in madinah last time the prophet he didn't he didn't use the state's mechanism collecting money and then give to poor people he asked the muslim to help each other so he, the role of the state to encourage mutual help. So he said to the Madinah people at that time, 
these are very poor people, they call it Sufa, who were staying in around the mosque, Masjid Madinah. They were, they were basically homeless people staying at the mosque. So he asked the Madinah people to help these poor people. So they bring dates and food to these people. So in other words, Islamic approach is to encourage the, the Muslim to help each other. And so that is the approach, not relying on the state. And then the state then start collecting tax. And everybody, they don't have each other. They, they pay tax reluctantly, GST, etc., etc. Very sour face, very angry. And then the state would then help. So uh, helping each other is no longer part of the culture. So the, we should be subsidizing each other directly. We see poor people, we help them. Rather than saying, oh, hey, state, go and help them. We should be directly helping each other. That should be the, of course, the leader should be the first example. Lah. Not staying a luxury life and then uh, have bad reputation in terms of wasting money, etc. Lagi teruk lah kan? Lagi teruk orang reluctant to pay tax, reluctant to help each other also. So every, everything is down. It's very, very wrong, wrong direction, wrong approach. We can, this is a big topic again. Um, who created this failed system? Now, not a, uh, the, the system, as I said just now, a long story, started all the way from Europe when, when, the, when the banking industry was allowed to start. Because last time there was no banking industry. Uh, when Christians, start, a priest, changed the, the law to reinterpret the concept of usury to, to mean excessive interest rate or biting interest rate, they allowed the banking industry to prosper. Now, the rich people of Europe at that time, they started the banking industry, the Fugus family, for example, right? And then, uh, and then of course, after that, the Rothschild, etc., etc. But when you talk about system, this system are the banyak parts. So you have borrowers, you have market makers, and you have uh, lenders. Eh? So all these are actually part of the system. The, the system. When we talk about the system that we have now, for example, why, why is the, the system able to grow and sustain? You need borrowers. Who are the borrowers? People who borrow money just now to buy, who didn't want to buy my car just now, right? <laughs> he, that, they decided to buy luxury car. They are part of the system. Uh, the corporations who want to expand in order to make more money, right? They expand. They are also part of the system. And the government who wants to impress the voters to give them handouts and then borrow money from uh, what? From some brothers, uh, uh, investment banks, that guy who... Goldman Sachs, how many million they got uh, in terms of commission? Uh, too much. <laughs> so, governments borrow money also. They are part of the system as well. Of course, the main beneficiary, the, the, the financiers, the owners of, of financial institutions are the, the main beneficiaries. Lah. They are the richest. Uh, but to, when we talk about parts of the system, we are all part of the system, uh, including the borrowers. So we, we cannot simply blame a particular group. We are all to be blamed. Of all, the worst is when you blame a particular race, for example, blaming the Jews, for example. Right? That is not right, right because the system now includes everybody. Right? If our Malaysian banking system is not owned by Jews. It's owned by, uh, main bank is owned by a PNB. Okay? Yeah, CIMB is owned by Gazana. So actually, we are all the Jews. Uh, <laughs> actually, right? <laughs> uh -huh. Uh, is Malaysian growth rate real? Well, this one, I think this is based on statistic department. So I wouldn't want to question how the statistic department, whether they are trying to lie to us or not. For, from what I know, uh, Chinese statistics may not be reliable. But Malaysian statistics has got a reputation of being reliable. Some of this uh, uh, growth rate may come from sectors which Malaysians are not involved maybe maybe the Chinese investment right? uh, the Chinese ECRL is actually a big, big project there so that will increase that will contribute but many, many Malaysians will not may not be uh, benefiting directly so they may not feel it uh, but the question is when should we be worried actually my, from my study of the whole economic system when the growth rate is high then you should be worried because that means the debt level is also very is, normally if you look at the debt level for example if, if the economic growth rate is about 4%, credit growth, growth could be more, more than 10%. So when there is a, when under the present system set up, when there is economic growth, you will know that the credit 
the debt growth is much faster. So when there is economic growth, you should be worried. Because down the, down the line, down the, uh, what? Down, the road, down the road, there will be a crash. Just waiting to happen only. Uh, so, uh, so the worry is, under the present setup, is the worry is when there is economic growth. Because it will not be sustained. And the, the faster the growth, the more worried we should be. Uh, so why, how, why can't the, uh, the regulators control all this, right? Uh, it's not very easy, right? Actually, why? Uh, the analogy is like this. I, this is my, when I study it, my, my thoughts about this. Huh? When you, let's say you allow people to take drugs, let's say, huh? uh, well, heroin, for example, right? We say they should be able to, we have got intellectual, we have got degrees, many people have got, gone, uh, have got high education, they should be able to figure out what is good and what is bad for them. Let them take heroin in a reasonable amount. Masa hari raya ke, saja ke, uh, 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 masa birthday party ke. Can you, can you, is it realistic or not? Okay. Uh, you know what I mean? Look at smoking. We, we can, can we say, people, no, smoke, smoke when it is actually uh, in reasonable amount, you know, right? Maybe two, three sticks a week or whatever. S some activities of human being, once you allow it to take place, it's difficult to control. And one of the things about this is actually debt. Very difficult to control. Once you allow people to uh, engage in debt few activities, you, it's very difficult to control. Look, when, when the economy was growing fast, uh, last time, you know, the US banking system, they had all kinds of rules. After every crisis, they would put rules. Uh, Glass-Tagall uh, rule, for example, to separate investment banking from commercial bank. And then later on, what happened? They repealed it because they want growth. They repealed it because they want growth. Everybody likes growth. When they start growing, they don't care anymore because uh, if anything happens, the, only the poor and the weak will suffer most at the bottom. The workers will suffer because company will get rid. Those who are the financiers, they, normally they are safe. Uh, the, the owners of big banks, they, they are... Robert Rubin was the one who was responsible for getting rid of the Glass-Steagall uh, regulation. So the financiers, they want, they want the uh, interest rate to be lowered because they benefit a lot from it. The managing directors of banks, when they can make a lot of loans, they get bonuses. Right. What is going to happen to the system in the future? That is not their problem. The most important is this year I'm going to get a bonus, right? So even now, managers of banks, they are thinking about bonuses. So if banks make a lot of money, expand, they will make a lot of money. What is going to happen down the road? That is not for them to think about, right? A very short-term thinking. Well, for many people, they are short-term thinking. Uh, even the politicians, lagi lah tu, they don't think about, they are only think about the next uh, election only, right? Uh, whether op opposition ke, Bandarasa National ke. In some parties, they only think about uh, election in the party, right? They want to survive in the party. Lagi short term. So, to think about the whole term, what's going to happen to society, humanity ni, that one, nobody really cares except for philosoph philosophers and maybe academics who don't, don't, people don't care. People don't really listen to them, right? <laughs> uh, so, I think about all this long term, but who... Nobody really pay attention to uh, academics, right? Uh, they say they are up in the clouds, they are not real, etc., etc. Uh, ideal, ideal. Um, austerity drive. So, when you have that, it's like a drug addict who is now in, in trouble. Do you give him drugs or cold turkey? Cold turkey, he, uh, withdraw from him, he's, he may suffer more. You give him more drugs, he gets in worse situation. So that is the kind of dilemma that is faced by many economists. When they reduce, uh, when they, when they, uh, country get into trouble because they spend more than, uh, in the case of Greece, they have corruption problem also. They were massaging the data. Many people, the people didn't know that actually Greece government was in debt because the data which was presented to parliament was, was not the true data. They found out later when the banks, French and German banks say no you are borrowed too much, we are not going to lend you money because we, we have the real data. So they, they couldn't afford anymore. So what to do now? So you, the bank said, if you don't, if you have to pay back, right? You have to start cutting. But 
That means, otherwise you, you will not be able to pay us back, we'll be in trouble. But at the same time, the French and German banks don't want Greece to go into, into complete bankruptcy and get out of, of the euro because then they, they, do cannot, they cannot get their money back. So they want to make sure they can get their money back, so they negotiated. So you, you cut this and cut that at the same time, right? You, uh, we give you some more money so that you will survive, so that you can pay us back. So, uh, yes. They give some more extra loans. Just like Malaysian government now. Lah. Basically, uh, uh, Malaysian government borrow money in order to pay our debts only. Our debts keep growing. Principal amount keep growing. They just they collect money, 30, 30, billion from, 30 billion from GST is just to pay the debt servicing. Yeah. The, the principal doesn't get reduced. So it gets, the principal get growing, grow all the time. Um, so, in other words, very, very, once you are in that situation, it's extremely difficult choice. Austerity drive, if you do not do that, you get into worse debt trouble. If you uh, what, do that, people, people will suffer. But it's like people who are drug, drug addicts. Once you are in that situation, very difficult situation, right? Okay, what, do you know that? 60% of Nobel Prize winners in economics are American economists. Look what happened to their economy, right? <laughs> huh? uh, subprime problem has caused great recession all over the world. 60% of the Nobel Prize winners in economics are Americans. So that shows you uh, what kind of uh, knowledge they have. Uh, property market? Uh, oh, okay, okay. Where the, the, where the prop, uh, property market is on the bus, a bubble, is it, it burst too soon. Now, uh, the, uh, we go back to the subprime. If, you, if, they, if the interest rate was not, uh, was not raised by Alan Greenspan, then the debt will grow, right? The bubble, is it a bubble? The problem is it was a bubble. They know the bubble will burst. Either you burst it now or you burst it later. So if you burst it later, then the impact will be worse. So what, what regulators do is they try to manage it so that, so that you, you don't really have such a big structural problem. But in the case of the US, was, it was, they, could, they, could, they couldn't do it because by that time, the bubble was too big already. They didn't realize that everybody was invest, investing in properties at that time. I think it's not easy to control an economy, basically, right? So uh, um, many, you know, do you know the famous, famous quotation by... Larry Summers. Larry Summers was the chairman of economic advisors to uh, President of America at that time, Obama. Uh, uh, the person who said it was Paul Volcker, ex Federal, Ch Federal Reserve Chairman. He said, Do you know what Larry Summers said during the meeting? He said, When the subprime took place, crisis, he said, The most important thing is that we must be seen to try to do something. Yeah, we must be seen to be trying to do something, that's all. They have meetings, they have, they have committees, uh, to, because they, don't, they didn't really know how to solve the problem. The problem, how did the problem correct itself? Actually, it, correct, it didn't correct. What happened was just a postponement. What happened is that many people went bust, they suffered, they got kicked out of the house, etc., etc., et and then the economy started moving again through more borrowing. So, actually, they didn't solve the problem. The problem simply is actually uh, postponed to another time. That's all. So what did they do? They don't really know how to solve the problem. Can they prevent this from happening again in the future? No. You can ask any economist. They do not know. Uh, they can never guarantee that this problem will not happen again in the future. I think I know, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren. Uh, Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think he was, he was trying to uh, expose to people, yes, what the excesses of the banks, but uh, to be f the person who was more probably uh, more. Uh, uh, was was really trying his hardest was Ron Paul. He was actually 
uh, explaining to people about the Federal Reserve System is all is all uh, basically a bunch of people making money. It was Ron Paul, one of the presidential candidate. But actually, when you allow the debt industry to grow, number one to exist, I'm I'm talking about I mentioned the word debt industry, yeah, because before this people have debts you can lend money, but it wasn't an industry. But once you have an industry, see, I, I like to use the word because uh, I want to make people understand. There are certain activities that when you don't make it an industry, it's not harmful. Best, uh, I'm, I have to apologize before I give you the example, but I have to use it in order to make people understand. Sex. Is sex good or bad? Of course, if there is no sex, we are not here, right? But... <laughs> The next question is, what about sex industry? See now? Ah. So you put the word industry there, then you know that what's going to happen, right? So same thing with debt. Actually, in Islam, giving loan is encouraged. In Islam, according to some scholars, is get more reward than donation. Because when you lend money, normally you lend to people who are really in trouble. But you cannot make money from that. If you make money from that, it's dososa. Now, that at the moment now, it's become one of the biggest industries in the world. You can see that just now, 217 trillion. So it's a huge industry. Something which is actually dosa besar become a huge industry. Then we are in bad trouble now because it's not an industry. It's not. It's not a normal activity anymore. It's like it's worse than sex industry on that scale. Can you imagine? So if you have that kind of industry in the world now, we are in deep shit actually now. Huh? Sorry. Uh, the question is what? Sorry. I mean, I mean, money to oh, to, to study. Oh, okay. This is a, this is a practical <laughs> question. Eh? Practical question. Should you borrow money in order to get education? Okay. Let me uh, share my thoughts. Eh? Do you know that at the moment now in the US, student loan is not now more than one trillion or so? More than one trillion. And many people end up in trouble because they borrow money to go for education and they don't have a job. So it, now they say uh, they are worse off. If they didn't borrow money to go for, for, for education, they, they wouldn't be in such a financial mess. So actually, in my personal opinion, you better be careful about going to debt under any circumstances, including education now. Huh? Because you, you graduate, you not, may not necessarily get a job. Now, I'm not against going to university. My children all go to university. No, no, except for the boys. I told you, girls go to university, the boys don't want to go to university. <laughs> my, my sons, they didn't go to university. One went to ITM, the other one just after Form 5, they masuk gede kerja. But, you know, my boys earn more than the girls. The girls are still asking money from me. Uh, one is already, uh, two graduated already. The one that graduated kept asking money from me. Another one is doing a pupillage. I'm still paying for her, uh, legal people, yeah? still paying for her. The boys, that the university degree, both of them independent of me. And at one point, one of them was earning more 10K, uh, 20 uh, something. So you don't need to have a university degree to earn a lot of money. Yeah? You must have life skills. Life skills are very important. So, but I make sure that they are not in debt. So Alhamdulillah, I managed to save money and I pay for their education. So. Make sure, I think parents now have got to be very careful. They should be, if they want edu their children to go to university, etc., they, they should spend properly, make sure that they can provide the, for children education. But if the children cannot go to university, is it the end of the world? You know, the richest guy in my family, the richest guy, my, my brother-in-law, he's a millionaire. He bought houses, he has a million, uh, bungalow, two, three million dollars worth, Mercedes, two, three Mercedes, no university degree. He, he left school and started work at Kedai, Kedataya, now he's the richest in the family. So, so uh, actually, uh, people over, over what? Give too much weight to university education. Actually, life skills are more important. I, I'm not against going to university, by the way. Oh, as my girls, uh, to be a politically correct also, all the girls go to university, you know. <laughs> okay. non-performing loans. Okay. So, in the US just now, we saw the 2.13 trillion disappear. These are NPL, right? These are loans that 
disappear from the system. So, so what happens is that uh, those, those are companies go bust. Uh, some people who work for the company are in bad trouble. They are, end, up, end up in the tens. Uh, but some people who are smart, like Trump, he went bankrupt a couple of times, but he knows how to play the game. So his company goes bankrupt, he fires people, and he survives. He has got his other ways of making money. Uh, so, uh, so MPL is basically uh, will hurt people who are... This is a, this is a sad thing. Huh? Many people work hard in, in companies, right? Our friend here work in GLC companies. Huh? They work very hard, <laughs> right? But they are, some of them end up as victims of the system. They, they think that oh, we work so hard. This, that's an Occupy movement just now. They work so hard, and suddenly they say, I don't have any more job. What did I do wrong? I, I went to work. I worked hard. I, I didn't do what? I didn't skive. I didn't you know, steal money from companies. Suddenly, the company doesn't exist anymore. I'm, I'm in bad trouble, uh, in bad situation. Uh, in America, this is everybody's confused now. They found out the reason is because the company has shifted the operations to India or to China, right? But the company said, we have to do this, otherwise we cannot survive, right? So they went off to China. Otherwise, you cannot survive. Now, Trump said, you have to come back. Otherwise, I will put additional tax on you. So the companies are also confused now because if they come back to America, relocate, their cost of operation will be very high. They cannot be competitive anymore, right? So everybody is confused now, uh, actually, what's happening uh, because the whole system is actually is wrong. Panjang cerita sebenarnya. Panjang cerita. Thank you, Prof. Nazari and Dr. Sharifa. Let's give a big round of applause to both of them. Uh, now, uh, you can enjoy tea break outside. And thank you for your attention.